ビデオ In doing this show, I've discovered that if you were ever a highly influential figure in the field of anime, chances are you either came from Toei Animation or Mushi Productions, especially Mushi Productions. I've always disputed Osamu Tezuka's status as the godfather of anime and manga since both mediums existed before him, but at the same time, I can't really deny the fact that so many major figures came out of his studio, Mushi Productions. A whole generation, in fact. And today, we'll be talking about another one of those people. Yoshikazu Yasuhiku, or as he's known by fans, Yaz, was born in Ingaru in the Hokkaido Prefecture of Japan on December 9th, 1947. Like many of his peers, he had dreams to be an artist. Also like many of his peers, he dropped out of university and joined Mushi Production as a means to get artistic training. Yaz stayed there until 1970 when he left to go freelance. From there, he bounced from various projects which included doing storyboards for Space Battleship Yamato and character designs for the series Zambot 3 and Adventures of the Little Prince. He would even do the original designs of the Lovely Angels for the Dirty Pair novels. But in the late 70s, Yaz would be encouraged by fellow Mushi Pro alum Yoshiyuki Tomino to join him at his studio Sunrise to work on his idea for a giant robot anime. This anime would soon blossom into Mobile Suit Gundam. While the story and direction was spearheaded by Tomino, it was Yaz who defined the overall look of Gundam. He served as both animation director and character designer, designing the Gundam franchise's most iconic characters, Amuro Rei, Bright Noah, Sela Mass, Giren Zabi, and most famously, Char Aznabel. Working on both the original series as well as the sequel series Zeta, Yaz played a huge role in bringing Tomino's vision to life and creating the look and feel of the Universal Century that would inspire future Gundam artists. It is no wonder why he's considered such a legendary figure, especially amongst mecha anime fans. But aside from doing animation projects, Yaz was also a mangaka in his spare time. And while this would lead him to taking projects that were incredibly obvious, Yaz's manga outside of Gundam were still relatively popular. Popular enough that he was able to greenlight a film adaptation for his first manga, Arion, which he directed and did the character designs for. A few years later, Yaz decided that he could make Lightning strike twice with another big budget film adaptation of his manga. Only this time, he would be using one of his more recent titles. And not only that, but he had enough industry clout to give it a stupidly big budget to make it a stupidly big movie. And the results? Is this what human beings create for themselves? Venus was supposed to become the promised land, but instead of milk and honey, there is only the desolation of war. And the people of Io and Ephrodia are preparing themselves for one more battle with Ishtar. I'm Susan Summers of the Independent Press. In the year 2003, an ice comet collided with the planet Venus, dispersing its harmful atmosphere and drastically altering its climate. This allowed the planet to be partially terraformed by Earth, who began setting up colonies in 2012. Now in the year 2089, Venus has a population in the millions with two nation states set up the northern continent Ishtar, and the southern continent Aphoridia, and both of the nations have gone to war. The Aphoridian capital of Io is invaded by the forces of Ishtar, led by the vicious General Gerhard Donner, who succeeds in conquering and occupying the city. Caught in the middle of this is a team of gladiatorial monobikers called the Killer Commandos, led by our hotshot protagonist, Hiro Seno. At first, Hiro and the Commandos try to keep carrying on as usual, but with the city under martial law and the local police force firmly siding with the enemy army, Ishtar's iron grip on Io becomes too much to ignore, and after one too many run-ins with the cops for minor offenses, it isn't before long until the Commandos decide to arm themselves and push back against the occupying army. Am I forgetting someone? This is the Venus office of the Independent Press, isn't it? And in many areas, the defeated well, Ukrainian soldiers are fraternizing with their... Who in blazes am I speaking to, then? Just a minute. The oh. You're gonna General blow Gerhard a fuse. Film of I've got to get my story through! Oh yeah, and tagging along for the ride is Susan Summers, a bubbly war journalist who has come all the way from Earth to get the complete scoop on the ongoing conflict. We'll go into more detail about her later. What a fascinating piece of history Venus Wars is. Released on March 11th, 1989, the film was an adaptation of a four-volume manga of Yaz's that ran from 1987 to the year of its release. I say this is a fascinating piece of history because it was one of those magical big-budget titles that came out in anime's cinematic golden age of the 80s, and it also might have had a hand in ending that age. I can't find a detailed history or data points of what actually went down, but what little I could find regarding Yaz and his relationship with this anime is... 
not good. It's obvious that both he and the main producers Bondi Visuals expected great things from Venus Wars and pulled out all the stops. Yaz was given a huge amount of creative control, not only directing, but also writing the script and doing the character designs. The movie was given an amazing score composed by Studio Ghibli's Joe Hisaishi. Bandai had a famous male idol singer, Kazuhide Uekusa of the group Shoentai, to do the voice of the main protagonist's hero. There was even a video game tie-in for this movie released for the Famicom. It's clear as day that there were big plans and high expectations for Venus Wars. It bombed. <laughs> Shut that kid up. As I said before, I don't have the exact data, but nearly every article I found mentioned that it was a critical and commercial failure. So much so that it's very likely a big reason why Yaz sort of exiled himself from the anime industry, and why so many interviews out there exist of him being completely dismissive of the entire medium. Venus Wars' failure could have also been a factor as to why anime studios grew a lot more apprehensive to handing out large-scale budgets to anime films like Candy after the 80s. 1989 was not a good year to be an expensive non-Miyazaki-led anime film after all. As for Venus Wars' legacy stateside, I'm sure many Gen X and elder millennial nerds remember it as a Saturday anime staple on the old sci-fi channel. I also remember this title being a minor whipping boy in the caveman days of online anime criticism. But these days, people have begun to reappraise Venus Wars. Even Yaz, who tried his best to bury this anime for decades, has softened his view on it in his twilight years and allowed for the release of a 30th anniversary Blu-ray with brand new box art he did himself. So already, this anime got me curious. And I'm gonna try to answer these two questions. Why was Venus Wars such a monumental failure? And does Venus Wars deserve to be reappraised after 30 plus years? First, let's talk about the biggest point in Venus Wars' favor, its animation. This being one of the last amazingly animated Japanese features of the 1980s, the animation of Venus Wars is stone cold evidence for why there are anime fans who favor 80s anime above all other eras of anime. Sorry to get all born in the wrong generation here, but it is a goddamn tragedy that anime can no longer look like this. There's just a quality to animating the old fashioned way using pencils, paper, and cells that just infuses the artistry on screen with the grit this kind of anime needs. Venus Wars mostly takes place in either a bombed out future city or the middle of a planetary desert, and they really made it so you can feel the ruin and dustiness of the setting. Even all the future tech, which includes things like monobikes, super tanks, and all terrain police cards that can go through small alleys, feel like the technology of yesterday with how broken in and well worn they all look. This feeling is also accomplished with segments where they have animated cells of the bikers thundering across live action footage of desert canyons. Sure, it looks cheap in music video y today, but to me, it really helps give the anime a roughness about it in spite of its big budget. And as always with the best anime titles of this decade, it's the far flung future, yet 80s fashion and hair has yet to go out of style. This anime was mostly produced under Yaz's own small studio, Kugatsusha, with his roster of talented artists. Animation direction was provided by Sachiko Kamimura. She's mostly known for her character design work, specifically her work with the City Hunter franchise, but she's a very talented animator in her own right, especially when it comes to effect-heavy scenes. Assisting Kamimura was Toshiro Kawamoto, who you might know as being the character designer for Cowboy Bebop. Both Kamimura and Kawamoto's vision for this animation really complement each other. You get the gritty, almost western atmosphere of Kawamoto's vision combined with Kamimura's emphasis on flair and action, and they work wonderfully in tandem. As for key animators, this was a film that passed through a lot of outside studios such as Production IG and Kyoto Animation, so a lot of talented animators are attached to this in some way or another. The climax of the anime was done by Production IG mainstay Hiroyuki Okiura, and it is this beautifully destructive symphony of infrastructure collapsing. You feel all the way to the concrete, rebar, and steel falling to the earth while crushing souped up military vehicles in its wake. And then you have this scene drawn by 80s animation legend Masahiro Yamashita. Yamashita always had an innate knack for drawing carefully planned out big action scenes. And you can feel the devastation of the scene as explosions just rip right through it. You really don't see destruction like this in anime anymore where the explosions just feel too clean and polished. In the good old days, you really had to make that fire burn and smoke billow to really give it that power and oomph. Venus Wars is just gorgeously classic 80s animation, and it's made all the more heartbreaking that it's chained to such a lackluster narrative. In terms of adaptation, Venus Wars the film is very similar to Akira the film, adapting just the first arc, and even then, mainly the highlights because you only have enough budget to keep this film under two hours. 
There are a lot of pros and cons in adapting a manga this way. On one hand, it sets up the character, setting, and story naturally, and you can get invested within the first five minutes. On the other hand, adapting the first arc of an extended manga to a 90 minute feature does take a lot of compression. And this can lead to things such as pacing issues, liberal amounts of exposition, the excising or complete relegation of otherwise important characters, and endings that are inconsistent with the manga's canon. Now I didn't have the time or access to read through the entirety of the Venus Wars manga, so I don't know what the exact changes are in the transition between page to screen. The story of Venus Wars feels like a rope. In the beginning, it starts out strong and tightly wound. Our setting, plot, and characters are introduced within the first 10 minutes, and it begins the slow burn story of them trying to adapt to this new, violent way of life until they can no longer stand the injustice surrounding them and decide to take matters into their own hands. But once it gets to the middle, after the commandos find themselves forcibly recruited into the Aphoridian Special Forces, the road begins to become unraveled. The location is changed, and brand new characters are dropped into our laps with little introduction. Suddenly, the story is no longer about working class punks committing an uprising. Instead, it's more about working class punks being grunts in a military. But the rope still stays in relative formation, thanks in part to Venus Wars' strong themes, easily the story's best quality. Anti-war narratives has always been a favorite of Yaz's. There's a reason why he and Tomino worked so well when it came to the Gundam series. The main theme of Venus Wars is about how war affects everyday people caught in the middle of it. While other space opera anime would focus on the tactical genius commanders and brave soldiers who are fighting the war, the commandos in the beginning are just bystanders. They are a trashy dirt bike gang who live together in a garage. The only reason they get themselves involved is because they get sick of being pushed around by the authorities and because their manager Gary is secretly running guns. Wow! Will you get a load of that? They don't look like mono bike parts to me. I would have said our team manager's been collecting these for quite a while. And when they do rise up, they get their asses handed to them. Turns out that a gang of untrained and ultimately cowardly dirt bikers taking on a superpowered tank from a well-stocked and highly trained military nation is a surprisingly one-sided matchup, even with prep time. You would think that the Aphoridian army who rescues them would be the good guys, right? Pfft, hardly. The commanders are recruited without their consent, and their commanding officers are a bunch of assholes who are constantly abusing authority and see them as nothing more than warm bodies to be put on the front lines. Even though it leads to some story problems later on, the commandos are justified in being completely miserable in their position and wanting out. Oh, and the cherry on top is that it turns out the Aphoridian government isn't an innocent party that got invaded. Hero, being the son of farmers, ends up revealing that his family's farm is just one of many fake farms set up as a means to secretly steal Ishtar territory and resources. And soon we saw we were only there to stop Ishtar from claiming the space, while the government was telling us that Venus would be covered in grass by the end of the next decade and our work would be rewarded. But it was a lie! And the only ones who got richer were the politicians! <laughs> So the theme is, is that there are no real heroes in war, and that both sides usually consist of opportunistic assholes. And it's a theme that could have rang with hollow centrism if it wasn't told through the point of view of those caught in the middle of the conflict. The themes of Venus Wars are strong enough to keep the story together, so it totally makes sense that when those themes get dropped for a mindless final battle that goes on for way too long in the last 15 minutes, it is at that point where the rope frays and is nothing more but a mess of loosely connected string. It's a shame that this story feels so uneven, but it still could have worked if some aspects were stronger. However, there is one aspect that is so weak, it is the source of all of Venus Wars' story problems. The characters. <laughs> Shut that kid up. Now, Akira might have problems with the story feeling kind of crammed and weirdly paced, but it was able to mask a lot of those story problems by having strong characters. Characters like Tetsuo, Kaneda, the Colonel, K, and the three Espers are all characters with their own recognizable personalities, wants, and goals. How all these characters react when their goals come into conflict with each other is what keeps the story interesting. Venus Wars has no such interesting characters, and that is the film's fatal flaw. First off, nearly every character would go great in a suit because they are stock. Hiro is basically a checklist for the typical 80s anime male protagonist. Dark haired teenager, check. Problems with authority. You have no right to keep us imprisoned in your camp. None of us was asked whether we wanted to fight. Check. Everyday Joe, who ends up stumbling into a world changing conflict. Still, been determined to pull me down a peg. We'll use that fight the enemy tanks. Imagine they're me. Kill them. Check. 
slightly misogynistic attitude. Give me a hand! Help me with the bags! The sky could fall in and women would still go shopping. What a stupid thing to say. Ooh, double check. And before anyone comments, yes, all of the following could also describe Kaneda from Akira, but the thing about Kaneda is that he is a far more proactive character. The reason why he joins the Resistance Cell isn't because he fell into their laps, it's because their plans coincide with his plan of busting Tetsuo out of the hospital and the Resistance has better weapons and manpower. Hiro, on the other hand, feels more like he's being tugged around by the plot. Whether it's by the Commandos, the Special Forces, or his girlfriend Maggie, other characters are always leading him down the narrow plot railroad. It's instances of, hey Hiro, come hang out with us at this abandoned penthouse that will soon be raided by the cops and you'll be forced to leave them on a lengthy chase scene. Or, hey hero, enter this race of chicken with me if you want to see your friends be discharged from the special forces because only I have authority to do that. And hero, following his stage directions like a good performer, obliges them each time. It's worsened by the fact that Hiro himself is kind of boring. Hiro is one of those characters that needs other characters in a scene to bounce off of, otherwise he's more or less a moving prop. His interactions with his girlfriend Maggie are pretty strong. They have the standard Romeo and Juliet plot with him being from the wrong side of town and her being an uptown girl. It's lucky for you I took that nursing course. You gotta admit I learned some useful things. I never missed even one lesson. I never played hooky once. The others all laughed at me. But I didn't mind. Though there are some scenes where it feels like they are this close to breaking out into a 50 style musical number. Who have you done this with? Miranda? Or Kathy? Nobody. You're the first. On the other hand, his interactions with the rest of the commandos feels underwritten. Despite being the leader, he never shares any close moments with his teammates and almost kind of feels annoyed by them. A relationship that highlights the rest of the commander's role as just being a group of annoying comic relief and cannon fodder. Get in real close and wham! Right in the balls! Shut that kid up. Even Hero's relationship with his teammate Will should feel like it's more important when he's the only commando who gets swept up into the gung-ho military lifestyle and wants the rest of the team to stay. I know I put my life on the line, buddy, to try and help Io. That was enough, wasn't it? Maybe. Don't forget the politicians have made peace. The war is supposed to be over. For the collaborators. But some of us ain't accepting that. But right when it feels like it's about to go anywhere, Will gets killed off to further motivate Hero's desire to get the rest of the commandos out of the special forces. And that's another thing Venus Wars has a problem with. Nearly every character not named Hero disappears from the plot after a certain point. And I shouldn't have to explain to you why that's a big problem. This ends up leading to a weird moment where in the last 20 minutes, Hero is the last member of the Commandos with the Special Forces, and the anime has to have him interact with Chris, the incredibly offensive gay stereotype. You're a good looking guy. We could always fill in an hour or two till we get there. Piss off you damn queen! Slow down. I know how you feel, but it's better to know what you are and come out. Out of where? This guy only has five minutes of screen time, and yet the anime treats it like he's been there the entire time with Hero flashing back to non-existent conversations with him. The best of all is firing one of my missiles at an Octo. Pow! Hey, that's power, man. Jeez, what a turn on. Makes a man fly! A lot of legwork for a guy who ultimately winds up being unceremoniously killed off and never mentioned again. Honestly, it feels like I'm just scratching the surface with all the character problems because there are just so many. I could talk about how General Donner is set up as this complete war-hungry monster with a design that makes him look like a member of the Izabi's extended family, but except for one scene, he's a complete non-entity. I could talk about Miranda, the sole female member of the Commandos who has an awesome design and is implied to be the most competent member of the team. And aside from being the one who first proposes the revolution to the Commandos, she has jack shit to do in this movie. I could talk about those characters, but then that would be taking away from the time I could be spending talking about the character that I'm sure everyone wants to hear my thoughts on. So let's talk about Susan Summers. Do you want a picture? Well, go on, fire! When I put the DVD for Venus Wars into my DVD player, I made a solemn vow that I would maintain neutrality and judge Susan by what I saw on screen and not what other anime reviewers have been saying about her for years. 
I'd even go so far to say that her dub voice isn't even that bad. Her actress, Denica Fairman, is a fairly experienced performer, having roles such as Biko in the Project Aiko dub and Ava Braun in the controversial parody sitcom Heil Honey, I'm Home. When I finally get to invade Poland, who'll be the first to know? The Poles? No! Rosa Goldenstein! Sometimes I'm glad I just talk about animation. Did you know this only lasted one episode? But I was unprepared. I was unprepared by just how shitty Susan is as a character, because her shittiness just completely sneaks up on you. In the beginning, she doesn't seem that bad, a bit full of herself regarding her role as a journalist, but clearly knows how to report a story, and her being from Earth makes her the perfect subject to naturally feed exposition to about Venus as society and culture. What's that on the TV all about? It's roller biking, if you want to bet. The killer commandos versus the Venus barbarians. A bunch of Class B hotshot punks. The fans love them. Me, I prefer Class A Grand Prix. But after the commandos get forcibly drafted, Susan ends up coming along because she was riding with them during the tank attack, and the resistance is worried that the police will find classified information if she gets caught. It's at this point where she starts really falling head over heels for Will, and has her naivety ratcheted all the way up to 11, leading to moments where she smugly calls Hero a coward for not being completely gung-ho about the war, even though he's doing all the fighting and she's just a tourist. You just won't admit you simply don't have the balls to go out against the Ishtarians like Will. You're wrong! Uh-uh! I'm not wrong. Look, I know you got shot back in Io and that might explain it, but, but spare us your lecture. You stupid I'm... bitch! <gasps> and in her next scene, she's throwing a tantrum and trying to emotionally manipulate Will into letting her ride along on a dangerous mission. The answer is I know it'll be dangerous! I'm a reporter and I demand that you cooperate! If I have another person... Don't I'm... give me any of that crap! Just another male chauvinist. I'm a girl, that's why you won't do it. <laughs> hey, ah! I got an idea. Lady, you ain't doing the press no favors here. And once Will ends up dying on the mission that she tried desperately to go on, Susan steals military hardware to go look for Will's body, and then afterward tries to assassinate General Donner in his chambers by herself, all just because the boyfriend she knew for three days tops was killed by his army. It happens that people die in war. Don't blame me. You deny it? Are you a coward? As well as a killer? Is that what the Istra General once chiseled onto his tombstone? And she completely botches it by still having the safety on, causing the scene to turn into one where Donner gets to show us how evil he is because Yes has been giving him no screen time up to that point. Take her away. So this naturally leads to her somehow still alive after making an attempt on the top brass of an enemy territory and her still being able to go back to Earth and print her story? I think what I'm getting at here is that the reason why Susan is such a bad character is because the story has no idea who she is supposed to be. On one hand, she is clearly a seasoned journalist who has contacts and enough know-how to navigate a war zone. On the other hand, she's a naive fool who's clearly treating the war as her next big scoop and doesn't know or even care how it's affecting the people surrounding her until it affects her. Man, oh man, I'll make every front page on Earth! And the question is, is Susan supposed to be a condemnation of the press as nothing more than chaos tourists who just see destructive wars as ideal television material? Is she an example of the importance of journalism who can get the real stories that state media won't tell you? Is she just another victim caught up in the chaos and destruction of war? Your guess is as good as mine because the anime clearly has no idea what to do with Susan. The anime wants her to be so many things, an interpret journalist, a critique of the tabloid nature of war reporting, a member of the team, an outside observer, the comic relief, a victim to show the audience how evil the villain is, and eye candy. No weapons, no drugs. I guess that just leaves her panties. Yeah, could be a secret pocket down there. Take them off! What? On Earth, we call them scanties. Because Susan has all these roles to play, some that clearly conflict with others, it makes her entire character feel like complete nothing. So when she gets what I guess is supposed to be her big redemptive moment of pointing Hero in the direction of the refugee camp where Maggie is at, my reaction is just a, yeah sure whatever anime. So what are my actual thoughts on Venus Wars? Well, 
as crazy as this sounds, I'm of the opinion that the animation is just so damn good that it almost negates the various problems I have with this anime story. This isn't a Project Eden situation where the script is just so bastardized and poisonous to the characters that all the good animation makes me wish it was in a better movie. The badness of Venus Wars is an easily consumable badness. You recognize the inherent flaws of the overall story, but they don't really bother you all that much. As such, you can focus all your attention towards the finest displays of cell animation the 80s has to offer. The grit, the grain, the attention to detail. Nothing but big, action-packed, hand-drawn animation set pieces to kick back and enjoy like a beautiful sunset on your front porch. Venus Wars is the perfect retro anime that you don't have to devote all your time and energy towards. It's something that you can easily just have playing in the background while you do other things. So while Venus Wars' status as a critical bomb is something that I can't say feels unearned, it doesn't mean we have to completely disregard it. If anything, it's an example of how high the bar was set when an anime film that looks this good can be considered a bad anime. <laughs>